You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and OHOT. Crossover children, all are welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 3, page 76. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome. Oh, and that's the robot, R080T. And I'm Announcer Man. And the Announcer Man. Thank you. Thanks for showing up, folks. Cheers, guys. Today's story is Not My Slave by Derek L. Palmer. About the author. Derek L. Palmer is a part-time writer who was once paid to dig a ditch for $5 an hour. Probably overpaid. He has won awards for his short stories and screenwriting, and his work has appeared here before, in the first episode of our magazine with his story Double Vision. His goal in life is to soil himself in the presence of each of the six actors who have played James Bond. Barring that, he'd be happy to have a story appear in the last ever episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine, which is today. Yay! <laughs> Achieved your goal. Congratulations. Oh, wait. Sorry. Story starting. We'd like to thank Norm Sherman for lending a voice. Oh, uh, of the Drabblecast. We'd like to thank Norm Sherman of the Drabblecast for lending oh, a voice. Oh, and Escape Pod. We'd like to thank Norm Sherman of the Drabblecast and Escape Pod for lending oh, his voice. that b Okay, hey, shut up. We'd like to thank Norm Sherman for lending his voice to today's episode. And today's music is by Zero Project. There's links in the show notes. Not My Slave by Derek L. Palmer Once, there was a young man who was in love with a girl. The young man was a sad, lonely youth, muddling his way through college the best he could. He tried to do what was right, but often failed, just like you or me. He had a few nice distractions from his mundane and ordinary life, and a couple of authentic joys. But he was unfulfilled. Things never seemed to go right for the young man, especially in matters of love. The girl who now held his heart was named Tawny, and she was a sight to behold. The sun in the sky could not compare to the shine and brightness of her hair. The rock resting at the bottom of the ocean would only reach halfway down to the base of her eyes. The sands in the deepest desert were not so smooth as was her skin. She was beautiful. Even so, The young man did not choose to fall in love with her. It had simply happened one day, under imperfect circumstances, out of his control. He didn't know what to do, for it seemed that with each passing day his desire for her grew, and in his eyes her beauty moved up a notch. He sometimes felt that he would die without her, but he hadn't died yet. He was mired in a non-lethal state of misery. For, you see, she was not in love with him. Oh, she knew who he was, and had said hello to him from time to time on campus, but she wasn't interested. In fact, when she looked at him, she found him as romantically appealing as one of her siblings. Only with much less affection. To her, the young man was a nuisance, a crack in a living room wall, a buzzing light bulb, a dark blob on a movie screen. And he grew more annoying with each passing day. She often noticed him looking at her over a book rack or sitting conveniently outside her classroom as she exited. He'd call her up and not say a word, or send her letters of rambling pseudo-poetry signed by no one. 
She recognized who they came from, for, you see, she had been beautiful all her life. The young man was sick in love with her. He hated it. He tried to go to sleep without thinking her name. But when he felt his warm pillow or the blankets around him, he automatically imagined it was Tawny there with him. On rising in the morning, he'd vow, Today I won't think of her. But the moment his guard was down, his brain would snap back to her, like a tree grown in a certain position. Yes, he'd call her and hang up. Yes, he'd write her poems and letters, trying hard to destroy them all, but some would still get through, as if with dastardly minds of their own. Of course, he'd look for where he knew she'd be, even go out of his way so their paths would cross. But not because he wanted to. With sadness in his heart, and her lithe form in his eyes, the young man took a walk through the city. He didn't plan out a route, but just let his legs carry him while he concentrated on his little mental tug-o'-war. He had a lot to think about, but it could all be summed up in five letters. How could he be free from this spell Tawny had placed him under? Why had he been afflicted with this condition? Was it all out of his control? Somehow meant to be? If so, when would it be over? Could he ever be happy? What could he do to stop feeling this way, to get well from this most unhealthy of obsessions? He knew how wrong it was, but her voice, her smell, all the fancies and imaginings were an addiction that he was too weak to overcome. But, what's this? The young man asked the heir as he noted a newly hung up sign. It was on a building door, the paint still fresh, and it read, Unnatural desires? Addictions? Vile habits? Obsessive behavior? We can help. Dr. Clin M. Neuros invites you to get well. Inexpensive and guaranteed to work. What can you lose? Inquire within. There was magic in those words. The young man could hear them echoing in his brain as if a human voice had actually spoken them. A specialist on really, really serious fixations? He knew the doctor had to be accustomed to treating physical addictions, but his obsession with Tawny felt pretty darn physical. Was there a nicotine patch for love? Every word on the sign fit the young man perfectly, especially the last part. For you see, he had lost even his dignity long ago. So, the young man went in, with a spark of hope struck in his tortured head, and looked around. The practice was tiny, with only one shaded window letting in afternoon light, and no one was within. There was only one waiting chair, a scuffed green leather seat stolen from a Chinese restaurant, and a little table with U.S. News and World Report, Popular Science, Newsweek, and Teen Beat magazines on it, plus a pamphlet or two. There was a painting on the wall, cubist and colorful, of a white dove being released by what looked like a gorilla's hands. There was no secretary at the reception desk, just a brown and white sign reading, Welcome. There was a little phone with a single line, and the hold button was dark. Also on the desk was an orange bell, and after a moment, the young man rang it. Many greetings, someone said joyfully from the next room. In walked a funny small gentleman with a white suit coat, a blue tie, tan skin, and white gray hair. His face was unshaven, but his sideburns were not. And the skin was white where they used to be. His bifocals were tinted, and his accent was hard to place. Caribbean, maybe? Perhaps Guamanian? I am Dr. Nurus, said he, and I welcome you to my humble place. The young man shook the proffered hand, somewhat wary, but desperate and told the doctor his name. He was invited to step into the office, and as he did so, he could smell onions and cinnamon bears. Take a seat, 
the doctor said. So what's your poison? Cigarettes? Drugs? Alcohol? No, thank you, the young man said, planting himself in an adjustable chair as dentists use. No, my dear boy, what is your obsession? Drink? Injectables? Small pets? The young man looked around the room. There were various medical instruments in sight, plus odd-looking appliances, skull caps, syringes, and scalpels. There was a brain floating in a bottle of bright pink liquid by the sink, and on the wall was a shiny framed picture. It was of a ten-year-old boy in a red button-up shirt, releasing a frog from a bottle. It looked like a still from a movie, but who knew? Not quite answering the doctor's question, the young man asked one of his own. So, doctor, what is your procedure? Is it painful? Does it require drugs? Is it time-consuming? The sign said it was guaranteed to work. Is this a legal operation? Okay, a couple of questions. Where are you from? He continued. What kind of a doctor are you? Are you certified? Some say so, (laughs) the doctor remarked, chuckling at his own joke. He clapped his hands. My boy, I am a special kind of doctor. I am perfectly qualified to remedy your ills. You see, everyone who knows me has complete faith in my abilities. No one has ever complained after treatment, and no one has ever come back to his vice. So, I have a question for you. Are you serious about wanting help? The young man looked down at his hands and let his mind go free. Suddenly, Tawny's gorgeous visage raped its way in, overshadowing anything else he might have wanted to think. He could see her row of neat little white teeth, as if she were getting ready to laugh at him. Yes, he said, his hands squeezing into fists. I thought so, the doctor remarked. Now relax and tell me your problem. There's this girl, began the suffering one. A relative? A very little girl? The doctor asked as though he had heard it all before. No, stuttered the young man, embarrassed. She's a girl I know from college. Pretty, smart, untouchable. I... I'm obsessed with her, doctor, and I don't know what to do about it. Every waking moment, she's all I think about, more and more, day after day. I've tried to put her behind me, but but I... Untouchable, repeated the doctor. Has she died or married another? Perhaps she's moved away to never return. No, he admitted. But she doesn't care for me, not even as a friend. The doctor nodded. Now he knew the problem. Oh, she does not like men. She is maybe attracted to other girls, perhaps little girls. The young man glared at him. No, it's nothing like that. There's nothing wrong with her. Nothing at all. It's just that I can't stop thinking about her. I love her. And you do not believe she will ever love you. The young man didn't have to think about this long. Not even God could make Tawny love him. No. Never. Dr. Neuros nodded slowly, sympathetically. I understand. I have seen this before. In some ways, unrequited love is the worst kind of addiction. Destructive, cruel, lingering, a kind of heart cancer. He opened the drawer, then looked back at the young man. Luckily for you, it is treatable. The boy looked at him with desperation and pleading. Help me, doctor. I want to forget about her. I want to never have to think her name again. Or have to feel that pain, like boiling water injected directly into my heart, whenever I passed her on the sidewalk. The doctor took out a little bottle. You're absolutely sure about this? The youth didn't even think about it. And if he had, Tawny would have interrupted him. Please, doctor. Very well. He handed the bottle to the young man. Drink this. It will make you sleepy. The liquid in the bottle was a foul, brackish yellow. What is it? Oh, you would never drink it if you knew. Now do it. The young man gulped it down, all at once, feeling horribly nauseous and dizzy. Lay back, the doctor commanded. 
Sleep? He did so, and was unconscious before he could count to Tawny. What seemed like a week later, the young man opened his eyes. He felt numb. He was confused, but he recognized Dr. Neuros's face as the one smiling down on him. Good afternoon, all sewn up. How do you feel? I'm not sure. How long was I out? Not long, said the doctor. Any headache, double vision, mild or severe retardation? No, the young man said. At least I don't think so. Fine, fine, the doctor said and made a note on his clipboard. What did you do? I uh, cut out the part of your brain that registers the emotion of love. What? The young man gasped with three exclamation points. That's not important, the doctor told him. What do you think of the result? I... I don't know. The youth strained to remember what had been bothering him so much he would have undergone such a frightening operation. It was something bad. Something so bad, it was almost like being damned. What had he done? How long had it been going on? Who else knew about it? I can't remember what it was I came in here for. Dr. Neuros grinned. I am pleased to hear that. The young man got out of the chair and didn't really feel woozy at all. Should I go home and rest? He asked. No, said the doctor. Just stay away from ice skating or higher math problems involving graphs for the time being. The youth nodded. He opened his wallet. What do I owe you? Uh, Twenty dollars. And tell your friends about me if any of them have a similar problem. Problem? Asked the young man. The doctor patted him on the back. That's a good boy. Well, good luck. Though confused, the young man looked at him with gratitude. He couldn't remember details, but he knew that this doctor had done him a tremendous service. This was a new beginning. Something had been choking him, and he could breathe again. It was as if the doctor had freed him from a prison of the worst kind, a sort of Auschwitz of the soul. Thank you, doctor, he said, and truly meant it. The young man suffered no ill effects. He went home as he always did, got the mail, spoke with his roommates, answered the phone, wrote a paper, ate, read part of a book, watered his plant, and waxed his elbows just like always. No one seemed to notice any difference in him, except to ask where he had gotten the scar and why part of his head was shaved. The next day, the young man went to his classes, wearing a hat. It was easy to concentrate, easy to learn. He took good notes, though it was hard to find a page in his notebook that didn't have nonsensical writing and drawings on it. The young man started out of his class and moved with the other students into the sunny morning beyond the building. As he was walking, he happened to glance at a girl coming the other way. She had long hair and long everything else, quite attractive if you like that sort of thing. She looked familiar, but he didn't know from where. Funny, it wasn't like him to forget names. He figured it must have been her sweater that looked familiar. He moved on to other thoughts and didn't bother himself with it again. Tawny, however, stopped in her tracks. She didn't know what it was, but there was something wrong. That irritating, revolting boy had been crazy about her, absolutely demented, for a long time. But today, things had changed. His stride hadn't altered in the slightest when he saw her, and there wasn't that sense of awe coming from him anymore. His eyes had met hers for the first time in months, and they had been emotionless. She knew just from that one glance, that she now meant nothing to him. She knew because such had been the look in her eyes whenever he passed near. Tawny's mouth moved, but she made no sound. 
She looked back, watching him go. He neither returned her look nor hesitated, and inside her heart, a disused and tiny corner felt empty. The young man, however, felt no such thing. He went about his day, his week, his life, never again tormented by those smooth, tawny-shaped shadows. True, he never loved again, nor returned another's love. Frankly, he never found any use for that emotion. He never called his family or kept up with his friends. He never wept at a film or laughed at a joke, or rejoiced at a song, nor understood why others did. He didn't stare at a sunset or play a game, or drink a cream soda, or stay up reading, or make a shadow puppet, or take off his socks and walk in the sand, or squeeze a handful of snow into water, or try to catch a grasshopper, or take a picture, or dislike bratwurst, or smell a pile of October leaves, or go to a batting cage, or crack his knuckles, or spit off a bridge, or comb his hair differently, or write a poem again. He never made another friend, and had changed so much that those who once considered him so became just acquaintances. True, he had become something more than he was before, and something less than a human being. But God was he happy. Author's Note There was a stretch in college when I was really interested in a particular girl, and what else is new, she did not share my interest. She ended up in pretty much every story I was writing at the time, and when I realized this, I felt pretty disgusted with myself. I decided, like the main character, that this was not a healthy situation for me, and I needed to put this little infatuation to bed. So, so to speak. I'm <laughs> sorry, you... A couple, of, <laughs> a couple of years before, I had written a song called A Special Kind of Doctor about a love specialist who has to give up his practice when he falls in love himself. And I decided to port that scenario over and write a story about it. This story was initially called The Last of the Cami Stories, since Cami was the lass's name. Then, A Special Kind of Doctor. I sort of prefer that, but I changed it to Not My Slave when a friend of mine suggested it, though I can't really remember why. The story served its purpose because very shortly after writing it, if not immediately, my interest in Cammy wavered, and I began to focus my attentions on more attainable women, like Grace Kelly. Thanks for once again running one of my stories. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the anti-Valentine's Day story. So that was our anti-Valentine's Day. That was the one. You know, when I read it the first time and I got to that last line and I was sold. Yeah, that the author could have just wrote that last line. No, that probably wouldn't have made any sense. He couldn't have done that. But the last line definitely sold it for me. I just loved the absolute bitterness of it all. That love is what makes people unhappy. And that once that was gone, this guy was so happy. See, I, that, I, when we were reading it, I just didn't get that. Because all of this stuff, it explains that he has no Jean de vivre anymore. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming in, uh, French chef from Little Mermaid. Nice that you made a, a guest appearance. Yeah, I thought, zoot hello. I can't believe that. No, uh, I felt like uh, he had lost any joy in life because of this thing that had happened to him. And then we get this totally contradictory <laughs> last line that says, was he happy, kids? Yes, he was. It was almost like, it's like, it, it kind of harkens back to a story that we did a long time ago. It was Good Day by Saul Lemerand, where uh, suicide was this wonderful thing that, you know, everybody was just solving all their problems with suicide. And this story just hit me in a similar vein, you know, where it was just like, you know what, you'd all be so much better off if we just didn't feel love, because it just screws everybody up. And this guy who has no friends 
and no joy, no anything is so much better off because of it. I think there's a moral in there, folks. <laughs> I just enjoyed that. All right. Yeah, and you've been hoarding that for a while for our anti Valentine's That's right. Day As I've been hoarding all our stories for this month, they've just... My precious, I've kept them close to my heart. Uh, as we were reading it, it was just... Oh, it's a really absurd story. I mean, maybe it's not as sick as Saul Lemonrod's story was, <laughs> but the way it's told is almost like a fairy tale. Uh-huh. Um, almost like you expect, you know, it's like, and yeah. then, boys and girls, this happened. And then she kissed him, and it was all better. At least according to the, the author's note, this was a really cathartic experience, I guess, this writing of this story. And, uh, you know, that's a, a power about writing. Yeah. Um, now, I, maybe any kind of artistic endeavor. If you're a painter, if you write songs, if you, I think so. Yeah. You can you can help yourself get over a broken heart. You can help express the joy that you're feeling, the the, the regret, whatever it might be. Uh huh. Maybe it's just the confession or the the, the sharing of how you feel is all that. Uh, I have no idea what I'm talking about. See, because this part of my brain has been cut out so long ago (laughs) that I don't... uh... But yeah, no, I totally know what you're saying. It's definitely, I think, that way for uh, people and whatever their demons may be that they need to excise, going back a few weeks. Being able to create something can often really make a difference. You can paint that. You can totally see that in pop music and, and rock songs and stuff like that. You see those people who are singing about whatever boy or girl has done them wrong and being able to get on with life because of that. That reminds me of uh, this movie uh, that I think we both saw this week. Okay. And it was 500 Days of Summer. I did see that this week. And it week. starts with, disclaimer, this is a work of fiction, you know, and it's not based on an experience with any person. And that means you, Cheryl Anderson, or whatever, right? I can't, yeah, I can't go, remember so? what her name was, but yeah. And then at the end he goes, Bitch. Well, that's right. <laughs> that just uh, everybody in the theater chuckled, and it really kind of summed up the movie. Sadly, I was a little depressed by the time that one ended. I'll tell you that much. I, you got to wonder if now probably that's not a real name, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously. But whoever that girl is that inspired this story, you know she knows <laughs> that it's her, and you know that everybody that she knows or everybody that he knows knows that it's her. And now that's some kind of delicious revenge, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure it is. Um, you know, I, and I'm thinking about like the very first Matchbox 20 song that ever got any airplay was Push. You know, I want to push you around and I will and I will. Warning, today's episode contains right. singing. I'm sorry. I should, I'll put this at the beginning. I Well, no, I won't. Suddenly this band came out of nowhere and and this was a really big song. And I remember that the girl that he was in this abusive relationship with, I guess she hired a lawyer to see if there was some kind of legal repercussion to get money for the song because she inspired it. And they were like, "Ah, yeah, your name's never mentioned. And uh, do you really want to come forth and say, I inspired (laughs) this song? Because it's a totally negative thing. And I remember in college, there was all this stuff about that shitty Alanis Morissette song, I want you to know the very first one. Oh, right. Um, uh-huh. I'm here yeah. to remind you. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, whoa. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Alanis Morissette's here in the studio with us. Warning. You might want to skip the previous 30 seconds of the show. Unfortunately, it's already happened, so it's too late. There was all this conjecture about who this guy was. And do you remember who everybody said that it was? No. It was Dave Coulier, the third uncle on Full House, was what they were always (laughs) saying. Was he's the guy that inspired this song. Was that the funny uncle? Can you do the quotes in the air? Sorry, yeah, quotes in the air. That was supposed Ah. to be his character. He was the funny uncle, not the cool uncle. Yes, sir. Or the real dad. It's, a, it's yeah, weird that Bob Saget's career has continued from that show. But, yeah, really. But Dave Coulier, it's like nobody wants to have anything to do with him. Somehow Bob Saget landed Funniest Home Videos, and that just oh. took him to the stratosphere. you got to wonder if how much money he made from it. And, oh, what an easy gig that would have yeah, been. Seriously. Except for maybe it's one of those where you swallow so many pills at night to be able to go to sleep. <laughs> because if you recall the level of oh, those it jokes. Was, oh, it was hideous on that show. You know, they at some point... 
they got rid of Bob Saget, but the show actually continued on, and they have Tom Bergeron on there doing. Yeah, the I don't show know now. who that guy is, but the level of jokes He's, has not risen at all. Well, he delivers them so much better than Bob Saget ever. You know, Bob Saget used to do the crap where like he, I'm I'm the squirrel walking down the street. <laughs> Look at me. That's right. He'd be like, Oh, I hope nothing hits me in the groin here. <laughs> And yeah. the audience would go, ah, ha, 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 ha. all these lobotomized guys and in the row. They got there on the short bus just to see America's Funniest Home Video. Yeah, it's and Tom Bergeron is not a funny guy, really. He's just a cheesy host. He hosts like five or six different shows for ABC. Even he can do it better than Bob Saget did it. You know, tonight when I kneel before my altar of Alistair Stewart. Uh I'm going to thank him that I don't know who Tom Bergeron is, okay? (laughs) Well, I have kids, so, you know, we watched Funniest Home Videos because it's one of those shows. It's the show on TV that you can watch with your kids. (laughs) Look, he's bleeding, Daddy. (laughs) Yes, honey. There was a couple of times, though, I swear my kids did do that. They're like, he's hurt really bad. They're coming out with a stretcher for him. He can't move his fingers or his toes, Daddy. Why is that funny? It's like his scrotum (laughs) had a zipper on it, Daddy. I... Uh, um, wait. How did how did we get on this? I'm not sure. Oh, oh, the, the inspiration for that oh, god awful right. Alanis, Alanis Morris song. And I know I I need to specify when I say that because <laughs> there's so many. If you were the guy that inspired that, so oh, you remember how people would always ask, "What's her name? What was her name?" The you're so vain. You probably think this song Carly is Carly Simon, isn't it? People would always ask Carly Simon. You know. If, was Warren Beatty the inspiration for this song, or was it Announcer Man the inspiration for this song? And she would never say. I think that was kind of maybe uh-huh. the mystique behind that song. It's like, oh well, you know, the person who it's about knows uh-huh. that it's about them. Just so that, that kind of revenge that's still paying dividends all this time. <laughs> Are you going somewhere with this, guys? I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sentiment in this story? Have you ever felt that way? I'm sure there have been times. I couldn't pull one of them off the top of my head, unfortunately. How about you? Have you ever felt that way? No, I, I, I don't think so. Well, I mean, my whole life. But no examples are coming <laughs> to mind. Well, okay. I, um, a movie that you and I saw together uh-huh. was Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Okay. And the very first line in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is Valentine's Day. A day designed to make single people feel like shit. <laughs> and there was a, I think there's a lot in common. This movie and that story uh-huh. of just the, the hurt of this failed relationship or the hurt of this woman that doesn't feel the way that you feel uh-huh. is so great that you're like, I want her erased from my mind. Right. You know, it never even occurred to me as I was reading this. How similar to Eternal Sunshine. Now, obviously, you people listening at home caught on to it immediately. Yeah. But you know what I mean? The, the, just how that was. And then we go into his head and we see all just like the really crappy things that ended the relationship. And then, But as he goes back, it starts getting nicer and better and you get uh-huh. some magic. And we did see this movie together, right? We did. But was that the time that you came and visited from L.A.? We watched it here, but that was a long time ago. I mean, I remember it. But oh, only see, I, I love that movie. I, I did too. I remember a whole year. And I remember loving it, but I don't remember it so well because I haven't seen it since that day. The, the, the concept was so cool, and just the fact. I mean, we don't really get to know her at all. It's just his memory of her, and you know, she plays out a part and is helping him not forget her. But that's his interpretation of what she's like. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, the way he feels. Or, or the way she felt. She was just like, I want this relationship over. I want there to be no trace left. And she's like, zoop. So she doesn't even remember him anymore. And then he goes and does the same thing. And he realizes he doesn't want that. That the good times and the bad times are what makes us who we are. If, if there was some way for Dr. Neuros to come here and open up my brain and remove just the pathos and the regret. I have regret the size of a station wagon in my skull there. And if he could remove it all, I wouldn't be me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, granted, that would be for the best. But, <laughs> you know, for somebody else, Lord, why am I talking? This conversation has derailed. No, you know, people will say that, that you learn a lot more from your mistakes, from the things that you do wrong, than from the things you do right. Yeah, it's definitely uh, something that, that helps you to figure things out. It's screwing up. 
you want to say anything about the story? Like I said, I can go on and on because you, I've got a connection to it. But Yeah, you, you wanted to tell the story that it reminded you of. Um, I, there was this part at the very beginning of the story that reminded me of something in my teenagehood. There was that part where he says that he wrote the letters and then he tried to destroy them all, but some of them still got <laughs> out. Slipped out. You know what I mean? I remember okay, there's this girl that I just, oh gosh, I, I just loved her. And uh, yeah, you say she's my pedestal girl, you know, the one that I compare everyone to. And okay. She's up here on some untouchable plane. Okay. So she was in my group of friends, my circle of friends, Ooh. my equilateral triangle of friends. And we would hang out and stuff and i'd just be like ah i couldn't stand it because i was just crazy about this girl uh-huh. and you know she was just one of those girls that would enjoy telling all of her problems about love and stuff with you and you're just going crazy because you're just like well just break up with him and date me <laughs> i wouldn't treat you that way everybody has to have that experience right probably but okay one day i wrote her a letter and it was all that of just we're friends but it's so hard to be friends with you because I have all these feelings and all that stuff. Three page, four page <laughs> thing of just. Okay. Oh, you're laughing. Apparently you can't relate to this at all. I'm just kind of seeing where this is going, I think. So I, I mailed it to her. <laughs> like the second it was out of my hands. You like, were trying to reach back into that post box that you can't get into and get it out is this from a movie is this, did, did i <laughs> see this in a movie got, and it wasn't really your happened. arm got stuck in there and then the mailman came along and saw you with your arm stuck in there and called the police this happened no. in a movie didn't it i uh, know there was uh there's that sting song about uh, the guy who mails the letter then he once he lets go of it he's sad about it and wants it back and can't get it back and then then you know where this story is going as soon as it was gone i was just like oh shoot you know what this means we can never be friends again. She can never be comfortable around me. She's sure as hell never going to tell me about her hopes and dreams and regrets and the first time she kissed a girl and things like that. <laughs> and that <clears throat> she liked it and can still taste her cherry chapstick. Is that that awful Katy Perry song? Yes. Specifically that awful Katy Perry song because there's so many. So I went to her house the next day right after school, right? And she was out doing things that pretty people do but her sister her sister was like 11 or something answered the door and i said you know hey I'm gertrude gertrude really okay so i said hey uh I, ma- I mailed gertrude a story that i'm working on and i left out a page do you have that letter that i mailed and that and her sister i swear to god dude went and he, she got it and she gave it to me Wow. And i was just like oh hey thank you i will get that page in there right thank you thank you very much and just took off and ran. <laughs> yeah, never, ever looked back. Wow, I didn't know where that story was going. Nice. And it was just such a, I mean, if yeah, I, I think if her mom had answered the door, would she have given me the letter? I don't know. But the sister was gullible enough. And plus, you know, I write stories and stuff like that. So maybe, yeah. maybe the mom would have fallen for it. Or, but yeah, if she had not, an older sister, and I, I'm sure the older sister would have been like, yeah, let's read it together. Ah! <laughs> So the letter hadn't been opened then. It just no, was, it was sitting still, on the table. I guess and, it had just arrived that day with the rest of the mail. And, nice. And yeah, I think I kept the letter still sealed for years. <laughs> and then yeah, finally just tossed it in the, in the fire. I had that same problem before I got married um, with my wife, interestingly enough. Yeah, I was friends with her long before we ever started going out. And I had that same problem where it was just like, if we go there, then we won't be able to go back. You know what I mean? So if it doesn't work out, then I just blew it. And I can never be friends with this woman again. And for a long time, I kept not doing things for fear of that happening until she moved back to Canada. And then, you know, we weren't friends anyway. So what did it matter? What are you talking about? You gassed up the... Right, that's Pinto, what I'm saying. And tore up there so you could proclaim your love that's to her. That's right. And you held up the ghetto blaster with the Peter Gabriel <laughs> song playing. and I wasn't going to be able to hang out with her anyway, so what was the point of waiting? What did you have to lose, right? Yeah, so I went ahead and went for it, and yeah, it turned out to be okay. Although, she probably regrets that. Regret the size of a station wagon over that decision. Who knows? So, so is there anything else that you want to say? Uh... 
this doesn't really relate to the story per se, but you know, recently I was looking around the internet and I found a comment that someone had made where they liked our show, but they were upset that it was just so dang long. Oh, so it's time for us to have this talk again. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that we put this at the end of our episode instead of the very beginning, because maybe we should Everybody's have. turned it off already. But uh, yeah, I was just wondering if, if people agree with that. Are, are, do we go too long? We've always put our rambling chats at the end of the episode so that if somebody is tired of our blather, they can just skip on to the next show. So maybe we don't need to have this talk. We just need to remind everybody each episode. Yeah, I don't want to remind anybody. That, <laughs> but people aren't automatons. They can click skip when the story is over or if they're not enjoying the the way that, that our conversation is going. And I admit that, you know, there are times that I say things or it's like, oh, geez, that's offensive. or Oh, geez, that's stupid. Or, or oh, geez, they sang again. And yeah, if you don't like that, don't listen. Don't force your – don't punish yourself. The guy the, in his post said that our post-story conversation should never be longer than the story itself. And to that, I say, well, sometimes it's going to be if we have a lot of stuff we want to talk about or if we've got a whole other segment like Irrational right, Fears right. or we just went and saw Iron Man 2, we're going to want to talk about that stuff. Yeah, I have to say that I agree in a way with that. The post-story comments shouldn't be longer than the story itself, but – we don't talk about the story itself all that time. We talk about the story for a while and then we move on into something, I think, if it goes that long. Like last year, 2008 or something like that, they put out like this definitive Blade Runner box set. Uh -huh. And it included like the one hour and 10 minute Blade Runner and then a five hour documentary on the making of Blade Runner. Oh. But it was so unbelievably comprehensive, this documentary. That it's just, yeah, one of those where it's like, well, the movie's only an hour and a half long. And this document, but you don't have to watch the documentary. That's true. You, and if you start to get bored, you can turn it off. I, I don't know why I'm even explaining this. It probably makes me sound like a jackass. But <laughs> if you don't want to listen to us talk, turn it off. I Sure, it'll hurt my feelings, but what do you care? You don't like me. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Just turn them off. Okay. So I guess we'll just we'll let people go. Yeah. But uh, hey, I, I just wanted to mention, we started the episode with a quote from Poltergeist. The day that we're recording this, Zelda Rubinstein has passed away. And so that's why I specifically wanted to quote her. I make fun of her a lot. I've even made fun of her on this show recently. Yeah. The the southern accent and the high pitched voice and I in no way disliked Zelda Rubenstein. I I'm very sad that she's gone. And you didn't even know who she was, right? Not until you made fun of her and then I had to look her up. And yeah, I heard that uh, it, she'd listened to that podcast that you made fun of her on and that's what sent her to the hospital, unfortunately. Oh no. Maybe you really ought to watch what you say sometime in the future. Anyways. I, I don't mean anything okay. uh, against her. It's just the same as my Sean Connery or my Patrick Stewart or whatever. It's just like I, I hope to honor these people with this impression. Yeah, and I think that people like her are very, very important in film and television and, and et cetera. If you don't have very interesting character actor type people, movies just aren't as good. If you don't have that person that can be freaky or can be the butt of a joke even. or You know, for example, like Clint Howard. You know, people make fun of him a lot, but he really adds something to a film when he's in it. Unfortunately for him, he's not going to be the lead character very often because that's not the kind of person we want to identify with. But all the same, without them, it's like not having spice to put on your chicken or doesn't taste as good. Steve Buscemi is always complaining about how he's typecast as the creepy dude. And he, I think he longs for the chance to play the Tom Cruise role or something like that. You know, he adds so much spice to a, a film as well when you get him on there to do a voice or to play a role. And similarly, Zelda Rubenstein was one of those people. She didn't have a big career, but you saw her and you remembered that's something that I think really helps. She had that iconic voice. Yeah. And I was telling you before that our buddy Ian, he had this channel, this cable channel. It might have been A&E. It might have been Bravo. One of, one of these channels that I've never had for some reason. Uh -huh. And there was this show that she did the last few years, and it was called The World's Scariest Places. 
And it was a documentary show where they would go, you know, on a tour of the insane asylum or they'd uh-huh. go on a tour of child molestation capital of the world or whatever it is. But she would narrate and he would call me up and he'd be like, oh, you should have heard it. And she's like, and through the halls, you could still hear the footsteps of the people or whatever. And he would do a really good impression of her voice. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, gosh, yeah. the hair has risen up on my arms. That's so rad that they get her to do the voice, you know. <laughs> Are, are, are our listeners, do they know who Zelda Rubenstein is? Are people suddenly Googling they, her? Well, if they don't, then maybe they are Googling her, and I'm glad to get her a few more hits. It's a worthwhile thing. I used to work at this video store in, in L.A. right by 20th Century Fox. And I, I, probably, I know I told you countless times, <laughs> yeah. but I probably told on the air too. Um, but th- th- we would have celebrities come in. And if it was a really big celebrity, they'd be super jaded. And, you know, they can't go down the street without somebody pestering them. Uh But we'd get like these low tier, three, four, fifth tier celebrities. And because all of the guys that worked at the video store were big movie fans, we would recognize these guys. We're like, oh, that's the guy on the subway from whatever, you know, kind of thing. (laughs) And I got to tell you, it was so much fun to see these people's eyes light up when When you said, I just saw you in... This guy, Michael Lerner, came in and I said, you know what? I just saw you in a horror movie, a Spanish horror movie called Anguish the other day. And he's like, oh, yes, I did that in Spain with Zelda Rubenstein. And he's like, and he sat and he talked to me about (laughs) Anguish for like 20 minutes or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh And since these people that they wanted to have careers and they wanted people to appreciate their work and a lot of times... People don't. A lot of times you're just like, oh, yeah, I'm that guy. Or I don't know who the F is that. Uh-huh. But to know that they're appreciated and know that they impacted the lives of people. I have countless stories of different people that are like, wow, thank you. You know, I mean, it's too late for Zelda, but I'm just saying she impacted my life. And here I'm going on way longer about her than I ever did when she was alive. <laughs> so people need to know that they're appreciated. They need to know that something that they wrote – or did or said once made a difference in somebody's life. Yeah, so if there's somebody out there that you appreciate, that you haven't appreciated recently or at all. Right after Valentine's Day, maybe they had a really crappy Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, why don't you I go know ahead I did. and do that? Sorry, appreciate man. them a little. I talked over you there. That's all right. Well, we'll let you go your way. Go go do that thing that he asked you That's to do. right. I have been Rich Outfield. And I will be Big Anglovich. And all I know is that the wine lasts longer when you don't got to share it with someone. Have a nice week, folks. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. Author's note. And I began to focus my attentions on more attainable women, like Grace Kelly. Thanks for once again ruin. Oh, running. <laughs> Freudian thing. <there. laughs> Thanks for once again running one of my stories.